Welcome, I'm Peter Denning, your host here in the Harnessing AI course series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the next level up in the machine learning hierarchy. This level is concerned with supervised learning. Supervised learning means that we're going to have the machine learn something under our supervision. And today's speaker is going to be Professor Marco Oriskanen. And, uh, He's going to tell you exactly what it means to supervise the learning of a machine. I just want to make a few general historical type remarks here. That uh, the, the kinds of machines that we've all been used to um, up through most of computing era since the 1950s are rule-based machines. And we have to figure out <clears throat> what are the rules for getting the computation done and then get them into the machine. So uh, <clears throat> we saw some of that when we talked about rule-based AI here. So there's some AI that's based on <clears throat> figuring out the, what the rules are and putting them in the machine. But that so, so doesn't always work as well as you'd like it to, because sometimes we just don't know what the rules are. So I think one of Marco's favorite examples is how do you get a machine to tell the difference between a dog and a cat? which we seem to be able to do pretty recent, e e easily these days. But what are the rules? Nobody knows exactly how to describe the distinction between the dog and a cat as a bunch of rules. So to try and build a machine that does it with rules is going to be very awkward and may not work very well. It certainly hasn't worked well in the past. So uh, the new generation of neural net machines uh, gives another way to go about doing that, but it requires training the neural net, and that's where the supervision comes in. The idea of a neural net actually goes back to the beginning of computing era also. There, was a, there were proposals in the 1940s to build computer circuits that were made of electronic components that look sort of like neurons in the brain. And the idea was that if you could do this, that maybe the machine would inch up on being closer to being intelligent. But it turned out that that was uh, too slow. Machines built that way were just too slow, and the, the type of machines that came into play were the ones that went much faster. So that didn't make the cut from in terms of speed at that time. Now we have special purpose hardware that runs these things, and they're extremely fast. So uh, Marco will be telling you all about this as, as we go along here. So he's been here at NPS for two years now. Uh, prior to that, he was at the Bose Corporation, which is a famous company for, you know, a lot of us know it as a supplier of high quality, hi-fi equipment, but they do all sorts of other things. And he did a lot of machine learning work with them. He has a whole bunch of patents, and we're very happy to have him here. Our Students who do theses with him love working with him. So i uh, introduce you to Marco and take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Peter. So yeah, as Peter set up this introduction today, we're going to talk about supervised learning. Right, so I'll, I'll start with some definitions and introductions and then uh, we're going to move into neural networks and how do we do supervised classification with neural networks. And then I'm going to end up uh, the lecture with some of the more advanced concepts that are recently emerging out in this space. So what is supervised learning? So, you know, there's, there's a mathematical definition. You know, in th this class, this is a higher level class, right? We're not going to go into too much math, but I will try to explain you concepts, right? So uh, supervised learning is really driven by the data set that we have. Right, so the way that we would mathematically define it, it it's any data set in, in which we would have an example or an input example that you know, sets up our task, what are we trying to do. So in this case, this is a visual recognition task where we have you know, input data in forms of images of cats and dogs. And then the key part is that we have a label available. So we have this kind of input feature label pairs for our data set, and that's what makes it a supervised learning uh, set up for supervised, le for supervised le learning problems. Now, another example of supervised learning is not, a, this not only this example of classification, but you're also familiar with the concept of a regression, where you're trying to estimate a uh, 
value of, of, of you know, continuous value. So for that, there's a, there's a very famous data set that's called Boston housing prices. And there, you know, typically what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out if we can determine the relationship between the value of the house and the uh, average number of rooms per dwelling, right? Like, so you're trying to estimate or develop a model that can help you predict the price of a house depending on the size of, of, of the house itself. And, you know, I'm going to go into a bit of a more formal definition where, you know, I, I said we're trying to figure out the model. So what is really a model? Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn this mapping from an input feature space. And in this case, uh, you know, if I go back to that visual recognition problem, uh, we have cats and dogs as our input features, right? So images of cats and dogs. And we're trying to figure out this mapping uh, between that input feature space into that label space, which represents our classification, right? And that is that function uh, f of x, which is also called a hypothesis function a lot of times. But that's our model. So we're trying to learn that mapping or the model. And you know, in this simple example, you just see it as, as a function of input features. But that model is really, you know, for instance, your neural network. You know, when, you, when we come to neural network architectures, uh, they represent that hypothesis function. Now, how do we develop this? Or how do we develop these models and train them? So in, in supervised learning framework, and you know, I like to make it almost as a recipe, because it ends up a lot of times being almost like a recipe that you can follow, is that you, you have what's called a training stage. So in a training stage, you have to have this big training data set where you have a lot of examples of these pairs of inputs and labels, right? And what you do is in, in kind of, you know, I'm going back to what P Peter mentions, what people previously used to do. Uh, what needs to happen is, you know, going from this input feature space, you would have to then extract some image features to compress those images or extract uh, the essence of those inputs, right? And then by having those representations, uh, you would then pair them with labels, you know, those training labels at the top. And then in the training process, right, you would try to, uh, you know, match the inputs to labels and train a model that can do that mapping, right? So you, you try to develop a model that could map from inputs into the labels, right? And once you go through that process, and it's an iterative process, uh, you develop that learned model. Now, as you're doing that, uh, a lot of times what can happen is that you need to ensure that you don't overfit on a data. So overfitting is, what happens is that as you're training on some sample of the, or what you think about it, your, your developed data set that you use for training, it's a subset of all possibilities that you could encounter in nature, right? Because you, you couldn't possibly take in all of the cats and dogs images in the world, right? You just had the labeled data set. So what can happen is that, you know, overfitting concept, it means that you just start to memorize the examples that you have in training. In order to find that, what we use, it's, it's called a validation loop that, that happens during the training, where you try to monitor yourself on, on some kind of a holdout data set to ensure that you're not overfitting. What that enables you is to have the ability to generalize later on when you start using your, your model on any new inputs that come in. Now, there's also one more phase in all of this, right? So we developed our model, and then in a testing phase, typically to report performance of your model, you, you had another holdout data set, which is called testing data set, which should be representative of all of those distributions that you can encounter later on. And on that data set, would, that would really mean like that I can, I can take a single image, right? It has to pass through same image feature extraction. You pass it to the learned model, and then you can make a prediction. And then with that prediction, if you, if you have labeled outcomes, right, then you can calculate the metrics of your performance. Or that's also the way that you would do inference, which means you would do predictions on new data that you haven't seen before. Now, I've mentioned that there, you know, I mentioned previously this classification task and a regression task. So I here wanted to give you 
a bit of a more you know, you know, kind of like something that you can have as a mental map, right? But uh, when we talk about supervised learning, we, we talk about two possible tasks that one can do. So you can do a classification, which means that based off of some input features, I am trying to predict a discrete variable. In this case, discrete variable is, is really categorical va variable of classes. It's a cat or it's a dog, right? And there's this other task, uh, which is regression, where out of input features, you know, based off of this label, I can predict a continuous variable. So in a previous example that I showed you were Boston housing prices, where you were trying to predict a value of a house. Because value of a house, it's not a class, right? It's a continuous variable that belongs to a real number that's positive, right? And it can be anywhere, you know, if we look at housing prices these days, they're quite high, but value can be anywhere on that line. Uh, typically, when you think about the regression, any type of sensor problem where you're measuring a continuous value, like a temperature probe, would be an example of, of, of a regression problem. Now, I will move forward and uh, I also wanted to address, before I jump into neural networks, right, I wanted to address this aspect of what we would call at this point classical algorithms, right? So if you remember when I showed you the supervised learning framework, I talked about extracting image features, right? So for the what I would call classical neural network algorithms, uh, typically uh, you would need to engineer really good input features. So that engineering of input features uh, requires domain level experts that have knowledge of signal processing and the problem at hand, and they can extract features from input data, right, such that they provide uh, uh, you know, in a way to set up the best possible problem in a sense that, you know, you can utilize the classical algorithms to do the classification or regression. Uh, you know, some of these algorithms include, you know, support vector machines, logistic regression, uh, you know, for the classification, and then, for instance, you have linear regression for, you know, regression of uh, estimating a continuous variable and a couple of others, right? And you know, the reason that I always bring these up is that if you have that domain level expertise and you can engineer effective input features for training some of these classifiers or regressors, uh, that is the most effective way of doing it uh, from the perspective of having something running on an embedded hardware and reduces the complexity of what the neural networks bring into a play. However, for many problems of interest today, these type of algorithms cannot achieve the performance that you can achieve uh, with more advanced neural networks, you know, depending on how nonlinear the problem is. So that brings us to the next concept of deep learning, right? And the whole uh, hype about neural networks and why they became so popular. So as I described you previously, if you look at the upper portion of the slide, right, in this classical machine learning approach, uh, you would have an input. Uh, in this case, its input is like an image of a car, so I'm trying to design a binary classifier, car, no, no, not car. And you, know, in, in you would have, in this classical approach, there would be a human involved in this process where human would you know, extract those features that you would use with one of the classifiers that I previously shown you. And you know, upon extraction of those features, you would apply an algorithm and you would have an output, right? What neural networks in deep learning build into a play, you can see at the bottom image, is that you only provide input example and you let a neural network learn data representations uh, that enable best possible classification. So you, in a way, removed a human expert for from engineering input features and enabled an algorithm that's data driven to discover best possible features to be used for classification. Now, what are neural networks? Uh, they first emerged in the 40s. Uh, in in 2010s, they you know 2010 they they started achieving human-like 
performance of many tasks. Uh, here what I have at the bottom is a depiction of a biological neuron. And as you can see that, you know, biological neuron gets uh, multiple inputs. It, it has some kind of internal structure that transforms those inputs and provides a couple of outputs. You know, so it has like, you know, in this case, like it has three outputs. And on the right-hand side, I, I, we have an example of mathematical neuron. And you can see that the mathematical neuron can also receive multiple outputs. Uh, it has some, you know, mathematical logic inside that transforms those signals. And in that case over there, I'm providing a single output. Now, there's, uh, apart from this aspect of kind of input-output and some nonlinear transformation, that's where all the similarity between a biological neuron and mathematical neuron stops. Right, it, it's just, you know, the, the mathematical description uh, really was inspired by biological description, but, uh, you know, you know that, that's, that's where the similarity stops. So I, I would leave it there. And you should always then uh, really focus on understanding the mathematical aspect uh, of a neuron uh, as you start thinking about these systems. Now, how do we train them? Now, the way that we develop these neuron, well, not neuron, the way that we develop these deep learning models is that, as I mentioned here on the left-hand side on the input, we have these pairs of input features and labels, so X and Y, right? And then in the forward propagation process, so that's our, what I called a, uh, our hypothesis function or, or the model that we assume that can work on this data set. So you assume some kind of a neural network architecture, right, that has multiple layers. So here I have three layers as a representation. Uh, you go through a process which is called forward propagation, where you take your input data x, you propagate it through your model, and you get an estimate or a prediction or an output, which I labeled y hat. Right, so then you go in and you compare that prediction with the true label y, you, you, and you try to minimize the error between the two. So what does it mean to minimize the error, right? Like you're, you're trying to, uh, I don't know if you guys know what the mean squared error is, but that's the similarity between the two values. So you want them to be very close to each other. So now, based off of the distance between those two, uh, you minimize the error between the two signals, uh, and you take that error and you backward propagate it. So this backward propagation is when you take that error and then you update the weights in the neural network. And that is one loop of training. And what happens is you, you do this many, many times as you try to get your model to converge to optimum value. And that optimum value is quantified, you can think about it by best possible accuracy on the data set. So when you start training, right, you might have accuracy 10% or 5%, right? And then as you train and iteratively loop through your data for many, many cycles, right, then you start increasing your accuracy in training and you might end up with something like 90% accuracy. But you continuously go through these loops. Now, to give you an example of the internals of the neural network, what do you learn through these weights? I will use the, the following example from the phase detection. Uh, and here, uh, what, what's happening is you, you have on an input is a, is a, is a phase. And you know, the phase propagates through three layers of neural networks. That's how I set this up. And this is a, a, a toy example. And on the output, you would have a phase detection. So here I'm using, uh, this, is a, this is an example from using a convolutional neural network, uh, which is a special type of a neural network layer. But what's happening is you can see that uh, I said that you know, the, the power of this deep learning is that it can learn the representations of data. So what these layers do, you can see at the beginning on the left hand side that 
first matrix of little features, uh, neural network is learning this small, simple features. Uh, they will help it decompose the image. So, so tries tries to learn, you know, almost like what's called these Gabor filters, or you know, these little things that would capture a gradient, or or certain kind of spatial directivity. And then into the next layer of representations, it, it learns how to, from those small input features, like or those subatomic parts, you know, to build representations of a nose or, or an eye or an eyebrow. And then in the last layer, right before you do a classification, it learns to represent the whole faces, right? So once you get to this to this part where it can represent the whole faces, uh, typically in classification, that means that there's, those are linearly separable and you can pull, you know, you can kind of have a, a classification boundary, you know, between the, or the classification separation between a couple of different face classes that you're trying to detect. Another uh, famous architecture uh, that I wanted to show you as an example uh, as I start talking about the number of parameters that are involved with this, is that in 1998 there was, a, uh, there, there was one of these seminal papers that came out. Uh, and this was an you know, effective application of these convolutional neural networks uh, to uh, classification of this MNIST data set. So the setup for that is that the you know, post office had a lot of uh, you know, they collected a lot of data with uh, handwriting uh, because they needed an automated system to sort mail, right? So some of those data sets ended up uh, being uh, quantified and prepared and, and shared uh, with the broader community for development. And, you know, the, really the MNIST data set is a hello world of AI at this point. So on, on that specific data set, right, uh, authors, uh, authors of this paper, uh, they designed this Lynette 5 architecture uh, that had about 60,000 parameters. It was in 98. Uh, and they managed to achieve almost a human-like performance on this uh, data set. Uh, what I wanted to bring out is that, you know, today our, today's architectures, they, they vary from 100K to more than 100 million parameters. And that 100 million parameters is really now at the mid-range because the latest architectures in natural language understanding and text processing, uh, the latest one has 175 billion parameters. So as, as they achieve better and better performance, you know, outperforming any human at this point on some tasks, the number of parameters is, is amazing. Now, what I wanted to bring up is to, to, to have you guys understand, you know, what is an output from a neural network, right? Like we talked about classification and different things. So the output from a neural network depends on your task. You know, what did you train it for? We talked about visual recognition or, or classification task, and this is the example that I'm going to use here. So, for instance, for a, an image like this, you know, uh, you know, for image classification, it is a probability of a class label, right? And, you know, what I did here, I, I used uh, Admiral Grace Hopper's image, right, to run through one of the available models out there that are pre-trained for image classification and just to see, okay, so what, what can happen? So I used this ResNet 50 uh, that was trained on another famous data set, which is called ImageNet. Uh, that model can uh, uh, can classify thousand classes, and what I had to do is when you take an image, so typical image that comes out of your camera, right? Like I think we're now at what 16 megapixels at this point, right? So that's a lot of pixels that that you have in that image. I think it's you know more than 4,000 by 4,000 pixels uh, with three channels, right? To to what we get from our cell phones, so. Uh, image like that has too many input features because each pixel represents an input feature. And modern neural networks can't handle that. 
So every single image that goes through one of these models uh, needs to be resized to something smaller. And typically, neural networks that you can pull out out of, out of web, you know, from web, they're pre-trained for something that's around you know, 224 to 300 uh, pixels, so 300 by 300 by three channels. So what I did, I, I took an image, I, I resized it, and then I ran it through one of these models, and it told me, you know, what, what it managed to recognize is that it saw a military uniform uh, with probability of, you know, kind of 70% for that specific label, and that was one of the existing classes. So I was lucky that one of the thousand classes that the neural network was trained on was a military uniform. So then what I, what I did is, you know, I thought, okay, so let me take something that I know it's not in the training data set, right? And I, I picked up a extension cord, or just a cord, right? And I ran that through the neural network, and he thought it was a combination lock with probability of 0.5, right? Which really brings us to this point that if, you know, with this classical, now, now I'm going to start calling this classical neural networks, right? They're deterministic. And uh, they, will, they always have to give you an answer. And there's not a really good metric of uncertainty uh, when you use them. So you know, whenever it encounters an example it hasn't seen before, it still needs to give you an answer. Now, another example that I wanted to give you is you know, why is the deep learning on the rise is that you know, a few years ago, the, you know, someone noticed that a single layer of mathematical neuron could be described by a matrix multiplication applied to its input vector. Uh, you know, GPUs are really good at such linear algebraic matrix calculations. And thank you, gamers, for making that hardware ubiquitous you know, uh, across all of the machines. Right, and then you know, GPU supercomputers uh, they can run millions of photos through CNN and train the network. Right, so when I say that, I typically mean about something that's hundred million parameters, maybe a few hundred million parameters, and can train that in a couple of hours. Right, and that assumes that you have like a thirty-two GPU cluster to run that. Uh, the other model, this GPT-3175, that has billions of parameters, well, you need much more hardware and, and much more training time. And those are very expensive runs, right? Like you, you're, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars to train a big model like that. Uh, and you know, what, what's interesting about our neural networks is that once they're trained, because training is that iterative process that takes a lot of data, uh, you can label a new image uh, in milliseconds because you just pass one image through a pre-trained uh, neural network and that's, the inference is really fast. Now, some challenges of deep learning is that you know, size of training data sets are enormous. You know, for that ImageNet data set, you know, it has about 10 million photos plus, right? Uh, you know, the question is always, how do you label? You know, do you label your data manually? You, know, you have to have a human labeler. Uh, can you use another machine? So I'll show you an example on passive sonar. You can, you can use AIS to, to label your passive sonar if you want to track you know, man-made targets. Uh, there's also a question about uh, you know, how much do you trust your training data sets? You know, there's a cyber security piece to it because then if you, if, you use, uh, if you use data sets that have been poisoned, you might be opening your models to vulnerabilities in future. Uh, you know, is there a bias in training data? You know, there was a lot of uh, news coverage over the last few years about a bias that's induced by not having uh, either proper labels or proper distributions within your data set. You know, think about that example of, of an extension cord and a key lock, right? Like you can, you can bias your, 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 your system by just not having a representation of the classes that you might see, right, in the, in the wild out there later on. And then there's also this aspect of interpretability or explainable AI, uh, you know, if you have a model that has five to ten parameters, maybe you can explain it. Uh, 
how do you explain something that has 100 million parameters or 175 billion parameters? That becomes a challenge. Uh, and then this, this aspect of opening yourself up uh, toward vulnerabilities in future, well, this is, this is called, you know, for instance, adversarial examples. So that, that's one, uh, one view of that. So, you know, th this is, uh, you know, adversary can create small perturbations on, Im you know, on inputs of images that are passed through these neural networks and uh, can significantly degrade their performance. So what I did here is like I, I made a smaller example where I took an image of a tank and I, and I ran it through that same uh, ResNet model that, uh, that I've showed you previously. And you know, tank has very strong features, right? Like it, it will, it will immediately say like 99% <laughs> or you know, 0.99 probability for, for something being a tank, right? Uh, but then what you can do is I can craft an adversarial example where there, there, you know, I just perturb a little bit the pixels in an image uh, and it can classify a tank as a tow truck and that's the highest probability with 0.3. Everything else was lower probability. And the difference between the two images in, is in the last image, but it's almost at the noise level, the difference of, of pixels, right? And, you know, that's one thing to be mindful of. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is this uh, new and, and, and emerging, uh, I would say, field within the deep learning and neural networks, which is called Bayesian deep learning. So you can think about it is that this is, this is blending of this classical and deterministic deep learning with Bayesian theory. And what that enables us is to get uncertainty in decision making, right? So your classical you know, deterministic architecture on the left hand side, right, is just has a single parameter per connection between those neurons. And in the Bayesian view, right, we don't have just a single parameter. We model distributions over weights. So weight is not a single number, but rather a distribution. So you can think about it, it could be a Gaussian distribution where we model mean and, and uh, variance uh, over weights. And what you can do with that, I, I'm gonna, and this is how I'm going to end my lecture with, uh, this is an example of, of data with passive sonar classification. So here in Monterey Bay, we, we, we have a platform, it's called Mars Platform. MPS has a passive sonar sensor on it. And what we did is we collected about year worth of data from it, you know, automatically labeled it using an AIS signal and then developed one of these probabilistic models. And then what you can see in here is, uh, and I apologize, this is, yeah, so latitude and longitude don't add up, but it, it's, it's down from San Diego, so it's a different data set. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, you have a ship that's going from left to right, and uh, not only can I classify a correct class, so collect, correct class here is class D, so which was a car carrier, right? So you, when you see in, at where the X is at the center, that's my CPA, so that's where the, where the sensor is. And then when I'm far away from the sensor, right, these large circles represent the uncertainty. So I'm very uncertain as I'm far away and I'm making errors in my classification all the way to the left. And then as I move closer to sensor, right, I start becoming more confident in my decision making. I, I make more accurate decisions. I become more confident and then you can see, you know, uh, when I get to this point here, I'm very confident uh, in my decision making. And then when I get very close to sensor, right, because uh, all these ships, uh, the signals become so strong that they overwhelm the sensor, then I start losing a little bit of confidence, right? You see how my confidence goes down because I'm now in the 50th percentile for error. And then as I go away from the, from the sensor, right, then I again gain my confidence and when I get too far away, then I'm very uncertain again. And this is a nice example for many of you because this also reflects a bow and stern aspect. So as, as I'm coming into the sensor, right, uh, th this is about 12 kilometers. So when I get within 12 kilometers, then I'm very certain. And then as I go away from the sensor, you can see that for much longer period of time, I'm more certain because I see the, 
because I see the stern, so the prop is turned toward the sensor, right? And I can see more signal, so I can track the ship, you know, with high certainty until 17 kilometers. So this is a way that you can see physics coming into a play and why having these Bayesian neural networks can help you have that explainability uh, through understanding the uncertainty of the model predictions. And, you know, in general, you know, AI is everywhere at this point, like these type of models that I've described you, you know, they're used in consumer electronics. You're likely engaged with them on a daily basis. Uh, they're really big in autonomous driving. Uh, out, you know, if you think about autonomous vehicles, there are a lot of sensors. So you have radars, lidars, cameras, all, all of that utilizes some kind of supervised learning to extract some information about the world around you. And then, as I mentioned, you know, the text classification and the, any, anything with natural language understanding is really big in this space. And that was all that I had for the lecture. I'm, I'm open to any questions that you might have.